paradigms in publishing. The participants on the stage today are Akash Shah from Jaiko Publishing, publisher at the Jaiko Publishing House. Over the past decade, under Akash's leadership, Jaiko has published acclaimed authors such as Robin Sharma, Sadhguru, Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, and Radhakrishnan Pillai, and has built the brands of a number of first-time Indian authors. In addition to its strength in mass market non-fiction, Jaiko is also selectively publishing fiction. The next we have is Mr. Ashok Chopra, Hey House. He has occupied some of the hottest seats in Indian Book Trade Executive's Editor of Vikas Publishing House, Vice President of Macmillan India, Publishing Director of UBS Publishers, as well as Chief Executive and Publisher of the HarperCollins Publishers India. Currently, he is the Chief Executive of Hay House Publishers India. Next, we have Trisha Bora from Juggernaut. She has worked at the Random House India, Rupa and Darling Kindersley, and is currently commissioning editor at the Juggernaut Books. Her writing has been published in many journals and publications. Next we have is Mr. Vishal Soni from Vishwakarma Publishing. He is a publisher with a discerning eye and is responsible for taking Vishwakarma Publishing to another new level. And the function will be moderated by Mr. Lohit Jagwani. He is a commissioning editor of business at Penguin Books. So may I request you all to put your hands together for Mr. Akasha, Akash Chopra, Ashok Chopra, Trisha Bora and Vishal Soni. Hi. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. We have a very interesting topic, shifting paradigms in publishing. My name is Lohit Jagwani. I'm a commissioning editor with Penguin Random House. And let me very quickly introduce the panel to you. We have a very eclectic set of people. So Mr. Ashok Chopra is the publisher of Hay House and uh, ex-publisher of HarperCollins. He's also written two books. Uh, next to him is Vishal Soni, the CEO of Vishwakarma Publications. Then there is Akash Shah, the publisher of Jaiko, and Trisha Bora, a commissioning editor with Jagannath and also an author. So I want to start with a very quick audience poll. How many people sitting here are publishers? Please raise your hand. Okay, not too many. It's a panel in publishing, so yeah. And how many people sitting here are authors? Quite a few, about, I would say about 30 to 40%. And, and how many of you are aspiring authors? Everyone. <laughs> Everyone, or well, small percentage of people. So I want to, because we're all interested in publishing, I want to start with a quick story about the most fascinating publishing market in the world. So in the 1950s in America, there was a completely fragmented market. There was you know, many publishers and many booksellers, and they were doing very well for themselves. Till at that time, the corporates decided to come in and acquire them. So acquisition of publishers, and you had bookstore chains by big companies. They opened bookstores in malls and, and, and high, high area locations where there were a lot of people, which means they had to pay high rent. So they needed a lot of books to come in and to be sold very quickly. That was a time when bestsellers came up and bestsellers became very important. But something also happened which was quite interesting. The independent bookstores took a hit because of these, uh, these booksellers. So what was a very diversified market in the 1950s became a very homogenized market just 20 years later with everyone trying the same formula. So keep this story in mind. I want to very quickly talk about a framework for this, for this conversation. There are three kinds of changes. There are changes which become a paradigm shift. There are changes which are incremental. And then there are changes which become paradigm shifts in the future. What is a change? What is a paradigm shift? Apple came up with a smartphone, with iPhone, and Nokia just, just thought it was a toy and nobody will buy it. Nokia at that time had 90% of the market. Five years later, Nokia was dead, and smartphones were 80% of the market. That is a paradigm shift. And we will talk about paradigm shifts in publishing in India. So let me start with you, Ashok. In the last 40 years, 
what paradigm shifts have you noticed in publishing in India? Everything has changed. Nothing is what it was, say, from mid 80s onwards, nothing at all. You know, and it's gone through various phases, but the only big thing, the best thing is that the printing book is still alive. That is, I think, the most consistent change that has been there despite all ups and downs. But otherwise, right from acquiring manuscripts, right from, say, typesetting and, you know, at the time when Akash's grandfather started, Jaiko, for example, and they were institutions, of course, in the industry, in the country, and the pioneers of what is today known as, uh, you know, Indian publishing scenario on its own. And uh, whether it was typesetting, designing, uh, even uh, uh, jacket designs, then came something for in mid 80s onwards. So I, I would divide it into Indian publishing in English into two sections, prior 85, beyond 85. And then computers came in, electronic age came in and everything happened. But I think which few people realize in India, the biggest change in Indian publishing, in English I'm talking of, was when a young chap came in, trained from the UK by the name of David Devidar, uh, David Davidar, and he changed the entire scenario by, by setting up Penguin India, very professional house, very uh, uh, goal-oriented, and with good training, and that is when the scenario started changing heavily. A lot of people, including the house where I used to work, Vikas Publishing House, which was the only main publishing house at that time, and before that it was Asia, and they uh, were all wiped out within a very short time. And then a lot of other foreign publishing houses came because till then it was only the educational publishers were there, Macmillan's, Oxford, Longman, but everything started changing. And then came something which I'm told again is coming back is the audio books. And those also went out, but I'm told they're coming back. I don't know how far that is true. The only publishing houses that remained were like Jaiko or Rupa, you know, some of these which are still very active. Otherwise, everything has changed because Indian publishing industry was always a one-man show. It was not run by corporate houses, just one man. Everything was run according to his whims and fancies. And there are hilarious stories from the publishing industry of India with these one-man shows, you know, that which are really a book can be written on that, how the publishing industry functioned. And then everything changed and the scenarios before you today. So Akash, let me ask you a question, which is of all the changes in publishing, what do you think was the most significant? Would you think Amazon Flipkart coming in or international publishing houses coming in? What, according to you, changed the, the game completely? There's a mic over there. Yeah. Hello. Um, yeah, I think uh, definitely the you know international uh, publishers coming into India was like a very very significant change because I could feel that you know as 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 you said you know we're sort of a we have a family run uh, a business uh, though now it's very professional except you know one or two people who may be from the family but uh, I think it did help to raise standards uh, as we all know that uh, bigger corporation. And they have a certain s system of working. They have certain uh, patterns of working, you know, which have been established over a period of time. Uh, while India was obviously very disorganized, uh, so I think forcing, uh, in a good way, to make everyone, you know, mo move to the next level in terms of organization, in terms of thinking, uh, on all aspects of editorial marketing. I think a few years ago <coughs> we didn't even know what marketing was in publishing. Even now, you know, I think it's kind of a hazy concept. Uh, so I think uh, just giving it uh, a more professional uh, kind of uh, uh, sort of uh, direction, mm -hmm. I think that was uh, I think that's probably the most important change because everything else follows through. So like if you look at Amazon, it's a it's a process of selling, right? It could be online, offline. So it's just moved from offline to online. It's not, you know, I mean it has changed the industry, 
but it, it still books are still selling and it's just another way to sell. Same with e-books, it's another format. So I don't see those as uh, you know very critical, but I think as, yeah, for foreign publishers, um, and uh, also I think the, the, the change in as India's developing, the reading tastes are changing a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the last 10 years, we've seen so many more genres uh, that exist that are, you know, people, uh, publishers are publishing in then 10, 15 years ago. It, I think maybe ten, there was, it was a very limited range of books. Uh, even within say, for example, though it's not our strength, so fiction, which we are, Ajay was actively de developing, there, there are hundreds of sub-genres in fiction. Maybe 15, 20 years ago, we had you know a few popular genres. Even till now, it was mostly romance. But I know, like for example, I'm reading you know a couple of books that are um, s s science fiction and fantasy. You know, I'm I'm following authors you know in, in that genre. They one may not be commercially successful. So you have a lot of other sub markets that are developing in the reader base in India as it's developing. And I think that's also a very important change. So you know, interesting you mentioned fiction and talking on fiction, there's a very interesting story related to e-books and I'll come to you, Trisha. In 2000, Simon and & Schuster and Stephen King decided to do an experiment. They put up a story called Riding the Bullet Online and every story would cost about two and a half dollars. At the end of the first day, there were 400,000 downloads. And I'll tell you the interesting part. There were only 10,000 handheld reading devices at the time. So Trisha, e-books was supposed to be the paradigm shift, but now in terms of revenue, there's only a percentage that e-books take. So e-books, is that a paradigm shift that's going to happen in the future? Uh, in terms of the paradigm shift, it may not be, it'll be a supplement, but uh, I, being in Jagannath, I've, uh, the thing that we concentrate on is getting reading material out to young readers because you need to cultivate a reading habit for a, for a publishing industry to survive, right? So, no, the, the print book will never die because that is the ultimate form of publishing. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, revenue-wise, it is increasing. For example, um, uh, juggernaut sales are... Uh, increasing every quarter okay so there has been uh, a significant number of uh, people on the app in one year we've had about uh, 400,000 downloads we have 60 80,000 active users so those are big numbers in one year mm -hmm. and when it comes to revenue it's only you know this is it's too early in s a stage to talk about it but definitely it it is something to watch out for this is the new change, not as, uh, it won't take over, but it'll definitely be a supplement. There's also an interesting aspect to this, to Juggernaut especially, which is you have data which shows how readers are reading, which most publishers don't have. So what have you found in your data about the reading habits of the young people in India? This is the most interesting part of it because we, it's, in Indian publishing we know data is very hard to get you rely on Nielsen, you rely on um, you know other uh, lists and things like that. But here you have data real time because it's, it's an app and you can actually track your reader. You can see how old they are, what they're reading, when they're reading. It's kind of creepy, but you can still do it. And uh, in a year, we found that the most read category is nonfiction. And it makes sense. So. Uh, any mobile app or any like uh, e, e medium, your demographic is generally 18 to 27 years old. That's kind of young India. And it's interesting to note that young India is very curious about nonfiction. The second biggest category that data shows is erotica. So it's, it's really refreshing for an editor and a publisher to have this information in front of you. To, you know and it's also interesting to see that you know you always think that if you're like doing a book for young people it's romance or something like that mm -hmm. but now you know that no they want to read politics they they very clued in they want current affairs and and especially if it's done well and especially when they're reading erotica on their phone could well that be that the new paradigm shift it, it it just makes sense like erotica on your phone is a private affair mm -hmm. right and so that is one thing that will 
probably last. Okay. I don't think erotica and print in this country will go very far because it's a whole attitude shift. It's uh, morals. It's all of that. Okay. And on your phone, okay. it's a private affair. So okay. it just makes sense. So Vishal, e-books and Amazon, how is that affecting Indian languages? Is it opening up the market for people? Yes, absolutely. It is opening up the market. Uh, I heard all of them. Means for me, there is no paradigm shift because I'm just new, four years old. So I'm just listening from them. But uh, what is helping us is after you know following all these publishers, we've learned a lot and something which is ready-made which came to us. If I talk about Marathi publishing industry, for them, all these things are very new. There are still many Marathi publishers who are not uploading their book or listing their book on Amazon. They would give it rather to a distributor and maybe do it or okay. only few. And those who have done it, they are you know calling it back because their accounts don't match. Okay. So okay. these are the issues. And all these people who are selling this Marathi books, generally, you know, they are not tech savvy. So okay. getting one person again to handle all this thing is becoming difficult. So only few distributors who are good, who could manage or they have a second generation or the present generation who can handle it, those people are selling online. Okay. Otherwise, uh, they've just started a year or two, they've started their own website. So they didn't even have their websites. If they have their website, they just give some information. You can do a study, any, any big firm. Okay. So there are very few counting, you know, countable publishers in this uh, language area, means Marathi I'm talking about, where they are with latest uh, technology, help and all those things. Otherwise, there's nothing. Else. Okay. So, so here, you know, we have a lot of scope to, you know, the way uh, English authors get services from their publishers, the way they do their, uh, you know, rights management mm -hmm. or selling rights and all those things. That has not happened in Marathi yet. Okay. So Akash, I want to come to you. You mentioned biggest challenge as international players and there's a, there's a very interesting anecdote about that. In, in 1965, RCA went and acquired Random House. And in 1986, RCA was acquired by GE. When GE opened up the books and started studying the businesses, GE expelled two companies right away. They expelled a poultry business and they expelled Random House because they couldn't understand why would RCA be doing a business which is very low probability, sorry, very low profitability, very high risk and needs a lot of investment. And Akash, now I'm sh the market's the same, the business is same. For you, the challenge is even bigger because international publications have come into India with deep pockets, with a huge number of backlist titles. So how are you contending with that? And how has that been the paradigm shift? I, I think it's, uh, you know, the advantages to, to the scale that you are, right? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you, you have advantages being a big player and you have a lot of advantages being a middle player, uh, you know, with a little bit of uh, history. So I think uh, what I've noticed is uh, still fundamentals of publishing, of uh, connecting, of working with an author are still the same. It's still a very human business. And as companies go bigger, if they cannot provide that personal connect to the author, which is obvious because you have, if you have more and more titles coming out, or you have a huge team, or you have too much specialization in the property, uh, the authors uh, may not be able to connect with each each uh, person. So I think uh, making sure that if, if uh, for us as, as, a, as a publisher, I think our focus is definitely to be as close as we can within business limits, uh, you know, and, and keeping a professional relationship, giving more access to authors in different stages of the process. Mm -hmm. So that uh, we're trying to develop that transparency yes, and a lot of authors here, I think, who will probably argue against me, but it's a you know, it's a work in progress. It's a, it's a vision that we have. And I think so far, even a few changes have helped us because we are getting authors despite Penguin being there, despite HarperCollins being here or Salmon and Schuster, we still are getting good authors. And I think um, also discovering uh, first time authors, you know, it is still about how do you assess the market as an editorial team? How do you find, uh, you know, manuscript that comes to you? Do you see that potential which someone else doesn't see? So I think those skills are still very people based. And if you have the right people, you try to build the right team, uh, you can you know, overcome uh, those challenges. 
Okay, Ashok, with um, now market being quite open, a lot of Indian publishers, domestic publishers, international publishers, and entrepreneurs doing this. How is the market going to affect readers and authors? In what way? So is it going to be, is for example, one of the things that happened in the US and the US being a market I've looked into is corporate players buying a whole number of uh, various imprints made everything very homogenized. Is that going to change with various publishers being in the domain? Will writers be able to write books which are uh, more provocative, let's say, or which challenge the status quo even more? No, I don't think so. Because firstly, we must remember that the Indian market is very, very different. It's in a compartment of its own. You cannot make any comparison with the publishing in uh, say UK or in North America, you just, even with regional language players like French or Italian or whatever it is, you cannot make that, uh, you know, uh, association with them because it's totally different. But you see, let's not forget what Akash was just saying. Even the small publishing houses in India have survived bec despite the fact these huge corporate houses like yours has come in. But the fact remains, the small is also beautiful. Mm -hmm. Small is beautiful. Please remember that. I published, for example, only after having been running HarperCollins in India for many years, where we used to publish over 200 books a year, and, and a d right cross-section of subject areas, I'm doing only 30 to 40 books a year. But we are very happy with what we are doing. Mm -hmm. And I haven't lost any authors. I have not gone out of my way to pay huge advances to and act through literary agents, my authors still come to me. Because in India, there is something known as the whole concept of that joint family. Mm -hmm. In India, there is something still known as your personal relationships with an author. For example, if I want an ex-author, I will never get him or her because Chiki or Trisha or somebody is already in connect with them. And it's nothing to do with money, it's nothing to do, it's a personal relationship. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, for example, um, just to give you an example, if you go to say, uh, Kiran Bedi, or Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, or you go to Anupam Kher, or to go to uh, Fali Nariman, try as much as you want, they will never ever go with you, they will stay with me, come what may. And I can proudly say that, we have not had differences of opinion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Of course, the international houses have a very big advantage. Firstly, they pay their authors. <laughs> no, that's a very, we have had a very big problem in this country. Authors were not paid, or authors were not paid. Let's face the fact, that is a hard fact. Or they were paid an X amount and say, okay, this is for a lifetime, you have sold your manuscript. No accounts are ever rendered because as you know, till the demonetization came and even after that, I'm sure a lot of things are, you know, in cash. Mm -hmm. Whether it's with the printing presses on record, you have X amount of copies printed, but off the record, you have a certain number of copies printed. That is why the multinationals came in. Okay. That is why the multinationals hold a sway with the authors. Now, of course, everything is changing. We are having more and more literary agents in the country mm -hmm. who are acting on behalf of the uh, authors. Authors are going to them. They are approaching the authors. So the ball game is changing a lot. But by and large, a lot of this game for smaller publishing houses is still on the basis of your personal relations with the author. They won't go anywhere. I just had one more point. I, I think uh, the regional uh, languages, as you said, uh, you know, Marathi and, you know, now, I mean, there are at least eight, or at least a minimum of 10 commercially viable uh, regional languages in India. So what we are also doing is looking at our authors and seeing, you know, if those books could be available in those languages, then we are able to translate ourselves and distribute in those languages. So uh, being local also has its advantages, you know, being, uh, you know, understanding uh, you know, what the local market is. If, if we have an office in, say, Hyderabad or Chennai or, or maybe Bhuvneshwar, 
we're, like we're, we're selling books in Oriya, we're selling books in Assamese, we're selling, and they're mostly translation. Uh, and they're all based on successes in English, definitely. But it's our way of spreading the author's message, being able to widen through the same content, give more access to that, uh, to readers to that ac across the nation. So that's another way that, you know, uh, we, we could compete. You know, uh, adding to what Akashi just said, there are two examples of from the olden days which are still relevant. I think just look at Rupa and Jaiko. They are your biggest uh, barometers to see where we went wrong or where we went right. And now I think with Chiki's company, she had a idea, she had a goal, and so far, and I hope it will last, They've been successful, introducing something very new which India did not know about. And she, of course, is a great publisher, the youngest and the greatest of publisher, and she's done it. Jaiko is still where it was, it's only expanding. It's never gone down. Look at Rupa, it's still a name to, in the market. It still has got a great distribution network, which is the biggest minus point of Indian publishing industries are distribution networks. Every publisher finally has to go through the same old A, B, and C distributors. Mm -hmm. All of them, their accounts are still there. Whether you get the money on time, not. Whether you get the stocks back or not, they're still there. If our distribution network was to improve, I think the whole uh, publishing industry would. When I was with HarperCollins and the India Today group, I, was, I would keep on telling Mr. Arunpuri, I said, you started, the entire distribution network for magazines, why can't you do it for books, mm -hmm. you know? And by the time they could decide, it was time to, for me to go, so I didn't pursue it. Okay. So, you know, yeah. adding to that, it's, it's also very um, interesting to note that it's not very hard to convince people of this new model, yeah. you know, just take it. So they get it, like first time writers, get the fact that, okay, we don't have to feel it anymore. Like it doesn't have to be a print book. When I tell them that, you know, like your average Indian book or uh, whatever at a 2.99 price point will sell, what, 3,000 copies. Mm -hmm. And then my book too, I can't find it in half the airports and things like that. So when I tell them things like that, they understand that, you know, this digital could be a way forward. Mm -hmm. And it's very uh, heartening to see that. Okay. Vishal, I wanted to understand a little bit more about the Indian languages and how that's going to change over time. Do you see, and we've already seen a lot of publishers publish translations. Do you see that market growing? Absolutely. May I think y'all are doing languages. Sage Bhasha is doing languages. Mm -hmm. And there are almost so many other. Westland is doing their own languages. So all bestsellers, I think now all big publishers have started their own bestsellers into their own languages. But those are only na uh, no notional, you know, notional so don't get swayed by that, <laughs> don't get no scared. No, 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 so that's we are not scared. That's only very, very cosmetic, that's, uh. that's a fact. So, uh, and uh, the statistics, what I had read earlier, a few days, I mean, uh, at least uh, six months ago, uh, English is selling lesser than the uh, regional languages in India, but these regional languages are scattered, you know, maybe Bengali is more or uh, Malayali or you know this thing but Marathi stands fourth in India which sells more mm -hmm. and uh, here the Marathi language is sold across globe so that is another advantage for us mm -hmm. means it's not only Maharashtra but uh, if you get uh, a good distribution channel uh, your books are sold in, in even in Baroda okay. so that's a big market Baroda where uh, Marathi books are sold Mm -hmm. And maybe J Akash would confirm that also. Mm -hmm. And there's a good market in Bangalore. Mm -hmm. Because most of the IT people from Maharashtra, Pune, they have you know shifted to. And so they need something to read. So they do buy there. But uh, booksellers are not ready to keep because that numbers is small. Mm -hmm. Apart from that, there's a good market in US. Okay. So okay. there's so many uh, authors sitting there and have sent uh, manuscripts to us. Mm -hmm. So we are publishing them and we tell them that we'll make it available on Ingram mm -hmm. or maybe FBA. Mm -hmm. So if you see uh, most of my Marathi books are available on Amazon.com. Okay. So there's a market. Okay. And Ash the advantage is we can do both languages together. That is English, Marathi. So that's an advantage. 
Okay. So okay. that's there, and we still have open for this e-books concept. So still, Marathi, there are e-books. There are almost no e-books. They are all PDFs right now. Mm -hmm. But people have started thinking on e-books that we should have some e-books in Marathi. Mm -hmm. We had a meeting where uh, state government librarian had come and told that. Uh, to our association, we have a good association. Marathi. He says that please start working on e-books now because government is going to fund them. So there is a lot of scope now, and okay. there are new writers. You know, the young writers they feel that chalo e-book aaya to bhi chalega. Mm -hmm. What she said, and they're doing. Daily Hunt had did few Marathi, but now somehow they have you know. Okay. Not seen that. Ashok, I wanted a macro view from you which is that for aspirational debut authors, um, are publishers b ready to experiment more with debut authors and are more debut authors getting published every year? Or do you see that repeat authors are getting published, we don't see so many debut authors coming in? Before I answer that question, with your permission, I'd like to just add something to what he said. Please, as far as regional publishing language is concerned, from experience of English publishing, I will say, don't ever, and don't and ever are in block letters, depend on the government. <laughs> they will not lead you anywhere. It will only make you go round and round in circles. You would have lost many man hours, lost half your energy, and you would have lost a lot of money. Don't depend. There is a huge market out there, uh, like Fisher was saying, everybody is developing, new items are coming, develop those. I'll just add to that. Uh, 2016, uh, government is coming up with a four crore fund where two uh, libraries. We have uh, 12,245 uh, libraries. Those are all government. Uh, we call it as Vachnale. And they all have grants. So the total grant which has been uh, used by government, state government, is 250 crores of which they are uh, buying uh, almost both crore, five crore. So all the books which they we submit to the government and then they select and they buy. But again, it should not depend on that because we have no control on that. But that they are helping to at least- uh, 250 crores, two years later, you and I will sit here and we'll talk <laughs> where did the money go. go. <laughs> it never books. Never. So anyway, coming, coming to the question that you asked, you know, it works both ways, all right? we do look at debut authors and all publishers do. There are publishers here, there are publishers in the audience. We all do look because after all, how long will you squeeze a lemon? The old, the old authors are there. No insult to the old authors. They are our backbone, they are our <laughs> the bread and butter. But the fact is, you know, it's okay an old author, one, two, three books do very well, but after that, some don't. It's like making a film. It's like making a Hindi film. You never know what will be successful. But yes, we depend on old authors because it's a name there which is in the minds of the readers, the book buyers. Okay, but we are all the time looking and we should keep on exploring new authors. That's most important. Develop a new author. Never mind if the, but after even the old authors are new at one time. And you have to, have to give them a chance who knows? Who knew when Vikram says first book was published with uh, this Calcutta, what is that name? Writer's Workshop, P. Lal. His first book, did Mr. P. Lal or anybody know that this print run of 300 copies out of which Mr. Vikram Seth himself bought 175 copies will ever become Vikram Seth what he is today? Nobody knew that. So you have to explore the possibility of new authors, and we are all the time looking at it. Of course, the rejection rate is massive with all publishing houses, but even if you get one good new author, two new good authors every year, you are made. It will help. We have given, Millie's here, Trish is here, Kash is here, everybody is here, and so many others. Look at the number of new authors who have been given a break by these companies. You know, the only unfortunate part is because they're new, they're not known, readers don't know them that well, so then they're not being named. But the fact is, they are, I'm sure even all of them will agree on the dais also, that they are being looked into and we are all the time looking for new manuscripts and 
please remember, send in your manuscripts, but send it, it when you are satisfied. Work hard on your manuscript. Anybody who says, oh, I can write a manuscript in six months is no writer. You know, just work hard on your manuscripts. It always helps to go through an agent because the manuscript has been vetted, a portfolio has been prepared. But even if you're sending it directly and wait, because we publishers are notorious for not replying <laughs> to the authors. We are notorious. We don't reply that your manuscript, and even if it, a secretary sends out, it doesn't fit into our publishing schedule. No reasons given it go. But the fact is, please work hard on your manuscripts. That is the only way you can go ahead. If you're not satisfied, don't. And a publisher, an editor who's vetting your manuscript, you are one yourself, you know that within 30, 40, 50 pages, we know how good the manuscript is. If it is not, it goes. Because the fact is that 90%, and I'm sure Millie and all of them will agree, 90% of the books that we publish have a shelf line, something between butter and yogurt. <laughs> That's a fact. Am I wrong? You know, it's only 10% of the books, if at all, that go into the backlist and that can be carried. And that's the backbone of any publishing house is the backlist. Mm -hmm. We keep on changing the covers, we be making different formats, sizes and all, but that's where it is. But yes, we want new authors. This is for everybody here. We are looking for new authors. Please work on your manuscript first, work hard. And don't come and tell me, which I was telling some friends here today, like yesterday it happened with me, I had an appointment with this lady who came and said, you know, I wrote to you, you gave me time, this is the book I've written, I won't name because she's from local uh, Pune lady, and she came with a husband, very nice and talkative, talking to me and says, and my husband says, it's very good manuscript, everything is great. So I listened to her, so I, then she says, so what should I do? I said, would you like me to be blunt about it? She says this, I said, you, your husband has seen it and he's very happy with it, but tell me what choice does he have? <laughs> what choice does your husband have but to say it's a very good manuscript? Poor chap has to go back home at night. He has to get his <laughs> dinner at night, you know? So don't... He never you yes. So that's what I told her. I said, if you want to talk about a manuscript, don't ever show it to anybody because your final judge there is only the publisher. He has to decide, or your literary agents who's going to market you. He has to decide, she has to decide whether it's worth or not. Your father, your uncle, your husband, your wife, they are the worst people on this earth as far as your manuscript is concerned. They are your enemies. <laughs> they are your enemies, you know? So don't do that. But please work on your manuscripts. And young authors, my only advice is, all these young people, aspiring authors, read, 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 read a lot. That is where you will, you know, increase your knowledge, your information, your brains will widen. It's, that is the only way to go ahead with it because the fact is English is not our mother tongue. We are developing that, you are writing in that. And if you don't read and you say, oh, I... My daughter is written at the age of 16. Well, I'm afraid she's not supposed to be writing at the age of 16. She's supposed to be doing more reading. Keep on writing on the side, but don't submit that manuscript to your uncle or to your publisher. Please publish it. The publisher can't help it, and then you get against your friend as the publisher. So that is always there, but do read. And if you are writing, please do send in, because we are looking for manuscript. We are looking for young authors. Does anybody want to give advice to first-time writers? Anyone in the panel? And if you have Anyone can take it. Yes, we will. We will take uh, questions as well. Up, apply to PILF uh, writing competition, okay. and we'll publish. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Maybe, maybe, maybe that uh, we should ask uh, the audience if, if there's anyone there who, if they have any specific questions on submitting manuscripts, maybe. Absolutely. So we will we will open the the flow the panel for questions to audience. Just a few ground rules. Please state your name, the question addressed to which panelist, and share your question briefly. Who would like to go? We still have about a fifteen minutes, so we sure. can have some questions. Okay, gentleman over here.
numbers. Sorry, Instagram could you numbers. repeat your question on the mic so that okay. everyone can hear you? Uh, sure. Uh, I, I'm a publisher in Canada, mm -hmm. so I'm do, publishing from past uh, 13, 14 years. And, and one point, just to add, there is, I publish only the first time writers. Mm -hmm. I don't publish any celebrated authors, okay? So I publish only the young writers. So, and the kind of thing is, ever, year by year, the numbers are dwindling. It's coming down at the young writers, means young readers. The reason why we are saying that the young readers have come, uh, numbers is coming down is because they are all studying in the English medium. The regional language is getting wiped off. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we are dependent on completely on 35 plus read, uh, readers. So what I want to ask is, is that younger numbers, is it coming to you for the English readers? Or is it reducing there? What is happening there? It is because English is an aspirational language for India, young Indians especially. To be seen talking in English and to write in English and you know to like be on social media and things like that. English is your way up for them, right? So they do come to us then. So that means there is still a reading habit with the youngsters. I think there's more, like, I feel there are more people who want to write than people who actually read. So that's why so the manuscripts right. yeah. that come in, some of them are in such dismal shape because they want to write, but because they're just transitioning from a regional language to English, you get a very poor quality of the written word. But uh, yeah, they are writing more in English. They they're not reading as much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the gentleman over there, could you please uh, give him a mic? Uh, hi, all. So we have been discussing about uh, the English publications in specific and also the English books getting translated into local languages for uh, a spread into the local regions. So. I'm just curious about what is the landscape for the local languages getting translated into English because personally I am from Orissa and then basically I have I have been awed by many local literature and it feels like okay if I can probably translate and get it published so how is the landscape at a national level for translations I can say it's quite encouraging and even 30 years back, we had some of the best authors who were translating works from Urdu or Malayalam or whatever, whichever language into English. So it works both ways. You know, there are such great uh, books in Indian literature in various languages which would have never come out to the public if it was not for the English language. I was at the Penguin office the other day and uh, uh, Miru or Millie gave me a Fares Ahmed Fares new book. I don't know whom it was by, but uh, the new poet, it, it was a new version of the poetry of uh, Fares Ahmed Fares. And they have done uh, many other books. Similarly, all publishers are doing it, you know, and uh, uh, don't forget that it, we started way back uh, in the 50s and 60s, this translation from regional languages to English. And one of the earlier books that was translated was Khwaja Ahmed, the Bas book, which was translated into English. And then the big book which made a lot of noise and which, was, which really sold well was Ruswa's Umrao Jaan, which Kushwan Singh had done with a Pakistani author. I forget the name now. These are all way back in the early 60s, late 50s. Amrita Preetam's book in, from Punjabi Revenue Stamp, Rasidi Ticket, was published as Revenue Stamp. And Sair Ludhianvi's uh, poetry was published into English, Nushad's poetry, uh, Kefi Saab's poetry. So right from literature to poetry to short stories, these have all been translated from various languages into English. From Kerala, you had um, uh, Ovi Vijayan, for example. All his books were translated by, uh, into English and published at that time by Penguin, and now some have gone to HarperCollins uh, India. I don't know whether you people are doing any. Yes, yeah, see, so they're all being done. In fact, I hope I'm not wrong by saying this. There is more 
regional language translation going into English than the other way around. Yes. You're saying that some of the most, uh, some of the best writing is coming from there right now. Just quality writing is coming from translations, you know, uh, from regional to English. Okay. In fact, we are also planning to get it into Marathi. Means, you know, from yeah, Bengali, Odia, Kannadi. Yeah. So we are planning to get it into Marathi. So that's our, you know, we're thinking of that. Okay, next question, please. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, good evening. Myself, Abhipsha here. And the question is to the entire panel. Uh, while uh, you are encouraging uh, young writers, new writers, first time writers uh, to send their manuscripts to you, uh, in terms of the rejection rate, you also mentioned that they, because they are first time writers in terms, maybe the structure of the language may not be according or up to your mark, or which you were expecting. So uh, the rejection rate there is high, which is understandable. But if you go to a bookstore on, the sh on, the, on a bookshelf, if there are established writers like your Sydney Sheldon or Enid Blyton, or, you know, you have, do you, I mean, uh, you have so many books from one single writer if you go through, maybe if the first three have been bestsellers in terms of difference in story, but after that, the seven odd books, if you see, they may be a repetitive story. So based on that, do you, uh, do you publish the books just because they are established writers or do you have a rejection, uh, you know, criteria there as well? You know, uh, the flow of manuscripts into any publishing office, small or big or very large, is massive. And 99% plus is junk. Okay, we have to reject it. But then, as I said earlier, there are books. When you go into a bookshop, bookshop, you're looking at Sydney Sheldon or something, please do look a bit more carefully. Don't be in a rush to get out. Study the newspapers, magazines on the <laughs> Sunday or whenever the books pages appear. Look at some magazines. You'll come to know what is being published. You know, there are some newspapers which even give you, and you don't have to buy them. You can go to your school library, your college library, see what is being published. You know, the books received, some papers have uh, columns known as books received during the week. Have a look at them. There's a lot being published. Then make up your mind whether a story is repetitive or not. That's a different issue. You'll come to know only once you've read the book. But every book is not repetitive. The storyline, you know, maybe a little common or something, but there is a lot happening there which youngsters, I'm afraid, do not have the time to go. Instead of spending half an hour more in the pub in the evening, please do go to a bookshop and spend that half an hour there. You will see how much more is coming out, not only from India, not only in the regional languages, from the world over. You know, we are not talking of boundaries. We are not talking of borderline. We're talking of, you know, literature doesn't have a boundary. So just see what is coming and you'll be surprised how much is coming. Even if you don't have the time, what Trisha said just now, please use your beautiful phones, the expensive phones that you buy. Go into it, look at it. Even when you are doing nothing, you know, instead of chatting to your boyfriend or your girlfriend <laughs> for 15 minutes, just look at it. You will see what all is there and they give you much more than a printed book is giving you. Thank you, sir. So the thing is, it's not as doom and gloom because although the uh, rejection rate is very high, what uh, e-publishers like us do is we have writing platforms where it's uh, you can put up your, and there's some really great stuff coming out of it. You can put up your stories, your uh, work will be reviewed like, any anything on Amazon, it's basically a peer-reviewed community, and so there is all of that. You know, if you're if you feel like the rejection, you're getting rejected by publishers. There are alternative ways of being heard and writing. So just uh, to go back to what you were saying about uh, Sydney Sheldon and you know authors like that who have you know you see a full shelf of books and I'm sort of uh, you know. I, I think it is b ultimately the publisher will publish what people want to read. Like so, if say Sydney Sh Sheldon first book did really well and the second one didn't do that well, and then I think the publisher's interest as the as the sales fall of those titles it reduces. 
but if there's if the author was able to create a reader base for his or her, her writing and it and some of them are very loyal readers that they want more they want another version of that story so then once you have a captive audience you keep building so i, I mean i know like say uh, uh, the, the P Patterson is an American, uh, you know, author right now. I think he's uh, churning out like 40, 50 books uh, every year. And he also has co-authors. I think they have... Uh, Indian authors. Uh, yeah, uh, with Indian authors. So I think uh, for the bigger names, somehow it does become like an industry. And that industry exists because they are readers. If a reader would say, no, this is crap, you know, I've read this 100 times before, and not buy that book, then the whole thing would change. So it's not the publisher only making that decision. It is also the reader who's saying that they want more of that, and that's how these brands are built. So, okay, next question, please, yeah. Uh, thank you, my name is Neil Bhatt. Uh, my question is for the entire panel. So, uh, in India, is corporatization of uh, Neil, I'm sorry to interrupt you. We just have the question really crisp. We just have sure. three minutes, please. Thanks. Okay. Uh, do you think corporatization of literary agents will benefit the publishing industry in India? Or wo uh. I'm sorry, can you just explain that a little more? So uh, I'm a first time author and I'm yeah. looking for literary agents because okay. uh, first time authors have no idea of publishing and how to go about it. And when I look for literary agents in the US, I can find 10 to 15 companies listed with the procedures outlined on how you're supposed to send your manuscript and everything. Mm. And when I do that in India, I find absolutely nothing. So you have to come to events like this and try to ask somebody who got published, okay, who's your agent and find that out. Yeah, so I mean, it's, uh, it's true that there, there are few agents in it, much fewer than abroad. And I think this, even in India, the whole uh, evolution of the agent is, it's kind of an in process, uh, Thing. I think it's just maybe, like for example, Jayco, we work with maybe three or four agents. There may be eight or ten, uh, you know, major ones uh, in India, maybe the smaller ones. So I think it's something that's an evolution, and then probably they don't have their systems yet uh, set up. They're one man, you know, teams, uh, most of them, a one woman team. So I, I think they don't have the resources yet to maybe handle it. But, but I agree with you. I mean, I, I think they, sh every, or even the publishing industry, we need, you know, far better systems with, with, every, with everything. Yeah. Okay, we'll take one last question. We're running out of time. So my name is Raju Mandhyan, and I heard you call manuscripts as dismal and junk, and we authors are attached to our manuscripts. So my question is, one, what's a good way to present a manuscript to Juggernaut? That's the first question. The second one is, how do we protect our intellectual property rights? On the streets of India, there are five versions of the same book. So give us a few tips. So for Juggernaut, it's really easy. If you go to our website, it kind of, we've uh, absolutely streamlined the process. So if you're writing a work of nonfiction, it goes to the nonfiction editor. If it's fiction, it goes to the fiction editor. If it's Hindi, it'll go to the Hindi editor. It's all listed out on the website and we get back in two weeks. So it's... There's no, it's all there. It's all mentioned. You basically look for two chapters, a synopsis, and yeah, that's about it. It's really simple. The other question. Does anybody want to take the other part with the question? The piracy issue. Well, that was the last comment I wanted to make, which I always do at every fest, is it's really up to you to decide whether you want to encourage piracy or you don't want to encourage it. Whether you want to bo buy a book at a railway crossing or a roadside pavement seller for 70 rupees or you want to spend 299 or 350, whatever the price is. Remember, piracy in this country has not been controlled and I don't know whether it can be controlled or not because there are wheels within wheels and piracy is not only for books, not only for music, it is for ev at every level. Even Coca-Cola is being pirated and sold. It's even medicines is a big racket, you know. But it is really for you to decide. And I always make my last request, which I told you that I would like to have the last word. Please don't encourage piracy at any level. I'm not talking only of books at any level. Don't do that because it's harming 
you may get a book in hand for 70 rupees or 100 rupees, but at the final thing, it's harming everybody. And especially aspiring authors, established authors, publishers, we everybody suffers at the end of the day. But even piracy in life just don't encourage that. True, it's very little money going out of your wallet at the end of the day, but you're also in certain cases like medicines, you're risking your life also. Please don't encourage, that's my humble request as a publisher to you, don't encourage that. Teach everyone, teachers, your students, parents, your children, your family members, don't encourage piracy at any level in your life. Okay. I just add only one point. My books, you know, we were into academics also. So whenever I used to go to a college to sell my book, you know, to students and all those things, the same book was available at 99 rupees or 90 rupees. And there are many publishers in Pune who do all, all, all sorts of raids during the admission season and all those things. So it is only for one day. They are taken, police comes, everything. Second day again, they are there. So there are no set, set rules to control it. So it is just, we tell people that, you know. So just one, sorry, so we're, we're completely out of time. There is a mic with a gentleman over here. Last question and yes. please keep it very brief. A question about the integrity of data that you all report. Specifically, everyone seems to be a bestseller. So how do we, how do we really know how you all connect, collect, collate, you know, and the present data to us, if you understand my question. Who wants to take it? Sorry, I'm coming again and again on the mic because my colleagues refuse to answer such <laughs> questions. <laughs> and I was always feeling jealous of them because they're young and there's so much of energy in comparison to me. <laughs> but the only thing you is- answer that. Yeah, you will answer no, that. No, you first start, then you No, no, you answer. <laughs> The data, mean, as far as the manuscript is concerned, and how many books are sold. The sales part of it. How do we determine who's actually a bestseller? Ah, you answer that. <laughs> <laughs> He's again passed it on to me. He says, "You answer that." Look, the honest fact is, uh, there's no hard and fast rule. The same book may be on one newspaper as a best-selling book, but on another newspaper it may not be there. Uh, this was my biggest complaint when I was running HarperCollins India, and I once went to, since I was also on the board of uh, uh, India Today Group, so I told once my boss, Arun Puri, I said, you know, I've already sold over 100,000 copies of Sri Sri Ravi Shankar's biography, The Guru of Joy, but not even once has India Today, our own magazine, put it on the bestseller list. 100,000 copies in India is a huge, huge figure. And I'm talking of 10 years back, 12 years back. It's never come out on the bestseller list. There's no hard and fast rule. But having said that, I must say, today things are much, much better. You know, there's the Nielsen report, which comes out every Sunday, th Saturday, Friday. Every Friday it comes out, though it doesn't cover the whole of the country, but it certainly covers 60% uh, I think of the country. Small town India is not covered and gradually they are covering it. And it's quite an authentic report. I have no reason to doubt so far and I've not heard from any of the publishers who doubt it. It is very much there. And I don't think uh, publishers can fudge figures anymore to give them out. Yes, where the figures can be fudged are when newspapers or magazines go to shop. You know, they go to A, B, or C shop and say, how many copies did you sell of this book in Delhi or how many copies did you sell of that book in Mumbai or Pune and they collate it. That may not be really true. Then in another case we publishers know, and I don't mind giving it out, is when we get a manuscript through somebody and he says, well, uh, 10,000 copies will be picked up by this and this corporate house or I will buy it or whatever it is. But the only thing is that it'll go through this and this bookshop as sales because it'll come on the Nielsen report. 
Now, that is certainly. But th that happens in every field in life in every country of the world. You know, that's all part of what we call the marketing gimmicks. But by and large, I think today the figures are not being fudged. The reports that you read of, you know, this is a bestseller, this is a bestseller, is by and large true. There is no such thing as it's not true. It can happen once in a while, which happens in every field. You know, in every, even when you're selling condoms or sh you're selling shirts, it happens everywhere. This is the highest selling. And we Indians are very famous that this is the highest bridge in the world, the longest uh, thing. You know, we are very famous for that. <laughs> Everything is there. So, uh, like even in, in you read the, your children's geography books, oh, the highest peak in the world. Nobody knows what that damn thing is, but it is. So we are very famous for saying so many million pieces sold. You know, highest selling pan masala in the world. You know, it sells only in India, so what is in the world, you know? It is like having an international conference <laughs> and say this and this in, in language of inter, uh, international uh, 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 conference and finally you find only in India and Nepal there. <laughs> you know, but it's uh, there. Yeah, but it's these are marketing gimmicks. They'll carry on, but by and large, bestsellers are bestsellers, what you read according to Nielsen report, and I think Nielsen is being covered by a lot of newspapers now also. They are reported, those are the firm figures, you don't have to doubt them. Okay, on that note, I'd like to close the session. You can have a word with the panelists offline, uh, but thank you so much for joining us. Thanks a lot. Thank you all for sharing your knowledge on the publishing world and giving us a very clear picture of the things as they stand.